morning, Anselm Bible family. Good morning, Facebook friends. Welcome to Anselm Bibles, uh, Anselm Bible Churches morning worship. Uh, we thank you for assembling this morning wherever you are. We thank you for uh, waking up and 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 arranging your morning to to join us and to be centered upon God's word this morning. That's what we want to where we want to find ourselves today and every day the life of the christian should be uh, centered upon his word and we are going to delve deep into the book of hebrews hebrews beginning in chapter 4 beginning uh the verse is 12 through 16 but of course first as is our custom we bow our heads and we go to our father in prayer father in heaven we thank you this morning for being so uh, mighty and so merciful, Father, so mighty as we as we see how you comforted us and protected us for from so much hurt, harm, and danger, Father. You've uh, you've, you've put a shield around us. You've drawn us near to your bosom, Father. Some of us may have suffered during the week, Father, but still we can see your providence. Still we can see your loving arms of protection, Father. Still we can see uh, that you are no shorter than your word for uh, uh, for your love for your children you see your mercy father as you withheld judgment just a little while longer we want to take full advantage and redeem that time we want to redeem it and redeem it well this morning uh, uh in in your word father we want to be filled with it so much so that it overflows you can't contain it. so that somebody might ask or somebody might wonder and actually say or knock on even our door just ask what's going on in there. I hear uh, peace, and love, and understanding, Father, and we can share it as you shared it with us. In your name, amen. Our title again is The Word of God Alive and Well. The Word of God Alive and Well. From the book of Hebrews, let's begin with chapter 4, verse 12. Hebrews 4 and verse 12. The word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him we have to do. Therefore, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are. Yet he was without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Reading these verses as I was traversing through the, the scriptures and through Paul's letters through the churches or even through some Old Testament text and landed here. And one of my favorites or one of a, a scripture that certainly is known amongst Christians, it may even call it a popular verse or so, but it seems so appropriate for the times from its beginning to end in this section of scripture, because we need a gospel. We need a word from God. We need a living and active gospel because these times in these times, we see that our culture is dying, if not dead. We see that the church is troubled and being tossed and turned and being pulled to and fro. We see the nature of the family, the structure of the family being completely changed without definition. We see God's institutions no longer as they were once instituted. So we need... The Christian needs everyone, beyond the Christian as well, 
needs this gospel, needs these words, needs this word of God. And that word is, is it's not just sitting there in the corner. It's alive. Well, I'll explain a little bit later as we, the title at least just a bit later and in a little more detail on last occasion, did a little bit of the background, talked about who, who the author is of the book of Hebrews. We know that we don't know <laughs> actually who it is. We know who we may be leaning towards, but we can't be dogmatic about it. And that's okay. So we talked about Paul and some other possibilities. And then we touched upon some of the impetus for the text, the convincing. The writer is attempting to convince these Hebrews. We talked about what being a Hebrew was, what being a Jew was, and how now part of that definition need be removed and replaced with this gospel, with this truth. And isn't that what the gospel is? Because these Hebrews, once defined by their bloodline and their right and rituals, now had to suspend or remove or, or step away from those things. They, they had become old things. And they were now a new thing. Hebrews 12. Excuse me, Hebrews 4 and 12. Where we ended was where we're actually going to begin, or the beginning of our text, actually. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Pearson. As far as the division from the soul, spirit for both joints, both of joints and marrow, and able to judge thoughts and intentions of the heart. The word of God. The word of God. Again, one of those, you might say within Christendom, within the pale of orthodoxy, we often say a big topic. The word of God. Something that we say often but maybe not very often defined, let's do so in this case. Let's make it particular to our text here. What is the word of God? If I asked you, what is the word of God? They, the, the answers would likely be related for sure, but they may be a little bit different in syntax and the words used. So if I asked you, what would you say the word of God is? What is the word of God? I know we're on camera, so I'm asking. Okay, but I'll have to answer it. But in your mind's eye, what would you say? Would you use words like the word of God is? You finish the sentence, the gospel? Probably. Doctrine. And there would probably be any number of others. The word of God is, is the Bible. Is what God has said. God's instructions for the world. What is the word of God? What God speaks, maybe. In this case, as we read our text and study in depth, we find that it is indeed those things, but we want to make it even more particular at least to when we define things, of course. We often go to the Greek to get the word, to get the transliteration, to get the words that define it, and of course, what we always say, and the ideas that are carried with it so that we can get a better understanding or a full understanding. In this case, the word of God is God's truth. And we can say, yeah, I understand that. The Holy Spirit certainly illuminates our mind to understand that the word of God, yeah, the word of God is truth. The word of God is the one thing that is the thing and no other thing matters to the Christian. Again, kind of speaking to or alluding to our title, a lie, and well, it's the truth amidst what? A world swirling full of lies, amidst confusion, amidst a lack of, 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 of clarity, in the middle of the storm, something that you can rest upon, something that you can 
oh my goodness, it just come secure yourself to so that you'll be not moved by any and all, as they say, wind of doctrine. Mm -hmm. So what is the word of God, the gospel, the truth, God speaking? Uh, it's God's truth, especially in this case. For the word of God or the truth of God is living and active. Maybe better, again, to say that, let, let's say the truth of the gospel. The truth of the gospel is living and active. Same thing, but just so we can have a clearer picture for the true Christian, this is easily understood, again, understood the word of God being synonymous to truth. It's the same thing. Doesn't have a problem with that. Truth in today's times. What would you do? How, do, how, how would not you, because you guys are Christians, I think, there may be a few out there who are not. If you're not, what would you or how would you define truth? What would you say that truth is? Truth for the modern culture, and it's actually the term often used is postmodern. Truth in today's terms is a relative idea. For the modern or postmodern culture, for the citizen in whatever country. Truth is something that is relative. Truth is not relative to the Christian. Again, truth to the modern citizen is a relative measure, not to the Christian. Truth is one thing, there is only one truth to the Christian, often termed also objective truth as opposed to relative truth. Objective is something that exists outside of or something that is not defined by multiples. It's, it is what it is. That thing is the truth, and whatever you think it is, is not what it is. It is what it is. Objective truth, the truth of the gospel. For the Christian, objective truth is the truth of the gospel. There's another term, actually, even more rigid, you might say, than objective truth. There's another term. Do you know what it is? Uh, uh, often <laughs> labeled amongst and I'll say it probably us evangelicals. It's a bad word now, isn't it? Oh, you're one of those evangelicals or you're an evangelical Christian. An evangelical Christian is one that uh, uh, rests, rules and abides on those firm and fixed truths. Those things that don't change. Those things that have been there for a long time and for the Christian, still there. That other term is a little bit heavier and weightier and more rigid than objective truth. And it is, starts with an A, absolute truth. Oh yes, you are one of those evangelicals if you believe in absolutes. Do you believe in absolutes? Amen. Do you believe in things are as they are as defined by the text, text of scripture? And do you, do you know what absolute truth is? And it, it, when you find it, do you recognize it? Label it as such. Lean upon it. As we've said for the Christian today, the Christ Christian is weary of modern language. It's, you might call it an Oprahism, and you see some of the folks in her network, and also many others. She's not the only, but she's certainly one who's a postmodernist. There is, again, for the Christian, there's no such thing as your truth and my truth and our truth. There's just truth. And we have to, and I think we said it last week, but it deserves being reiterated. We have to be very weary as Christians uh, of not accepting and adopting worldly language. 
that gives life to those postmodern, modern ideas of things like truth. Because again, if you have a truth and I have a truth and we all have our truths, then there ain't no truth. There's just relativism. Postmodern thought insists that truth is relative. That there is no one. There are multiples. We've often mentioned in that old uh, uh, television clip with, with Oprah where uh, there, there, and she's saying, well, there's got to be more than one way to God. There's just got to be. And she says so with utter uh, absolutism in her voice. She's saying it as if, as if that's the absolute. As if the thing that is true is that there are multiple or different ways. And we know what scripture says. So the scriptures, and we've heard, and if you you don't have to do a uh, uh, an extensive search. If you punch it in, if you Google it, and you can find supposed evangelicals that would not argue. Or that would agree with. That, yeah, well, there may be more than one way to God. Oprah certainly said so, and that clip is pretty famous. And again, she's, and, and again, not, not pinning that on her from times past, because she certainly still believes as such. It's not all about Oprah, though. It's about the culture in its entirety. This is about the church and being absolute in your belief. The truth to the Christian is absolute. It is not relative. Relative truth, just for if we took a loose definition, means that each group or individual decides for themselves what is true. Again, relative truth. That means truth as it relates to me. That's what it means. Well, how do I see it? And however I see it is what it is. Relative truth is, again, each group or individual decides for themselves what is true. What is true or right for one person or group is not necessarily true or right for another. So you can have yours and I can have mine and what's right for you. Well, you go ahead and do that. Well, what's right for me is right for me because I get to define it. One noted theologue said this about relative truth or relativism. And by the way, postmodern and relativism are virtually synonymous because postmodernism, this thought that it's, that, that is a late 20th century philosophy is one that challenges everything and does not believe in absolutes. They're virtually synonymous. One noted theologue says about cultures that have adopted relativism. He says, no culture in history has ever embraced moral relativism and survived. Our own culture, therefore, will either be the first to disprove history's clearest lesson, so we'll either stay there, continue to exist, thir uh, flourish and thrive, in the midst of relativism and prove it wrong, is what he says, or persist in relativism and die. Or three, repent of its relativism and live. There is no other option, he says. It's a great quote. It's a great quote because he says, well, either it's not true, or it is true, and we will die, or we will change and live. Read it again. No culture in history has ever embraced moral relativism and survived. Our own culture will therefore, we will either be the first to disprove history's clearest lesson, or persist in relativism and die, or repent and you know this man is a believer, right? Because he uses what word? Repent. He's saying relativism is sin. He's saying, oh, let me tell you an absolute. To believe that truth is more than one thing or defined by you or me or it or they and not what it is, is a sin. Mm -hmm. And when adopted by a culture, that culture needs to do what? Repent 
of its relativism, then you got a chance to live. There is no other option. Very general question for you today, Saints. What does the truth do for you? And really, and, and I don't want to say what it means to you, because that's cool too. I could ask that question. But what does it do for you, the Christian? And I know we're on camera again. It'd be great if we were sitting in our little building and we can talk back a little bit. But that's fine. Think about it. What does the truth do for you? Because we're talking about the word of God. And we are, uh, uh, we're, we're understanding that meeting in this context to be true, right? So the truth of the word of God or the truth of God. And we're saying that truth is active. It's living and active. So that's why I'm asking if it's living and it's active, then it's busy and do, what does the truth do for you? Because when I got to thinking about that, it's like, wow, yes, what does it do for me, the Christian? What does it do? It clarifies all. Clears up the muddy waters, doesn't it? It declares simply right mm -hmm. and wrong. Well, that's an absolute thought, isn't it? Right and wrong is an absolute thought. Well, we you don't really want to tell somebody what's right and wrong. You want to allow them to. And when I say Christians have bought into that, because there are Christians that believe and have believed for multiple generations now that they want to allow their children to decide whether or not they want to accept or believe or 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 or, or adopt. I want to let them decide for what? themselves that is a postmodern relative relativistic non-christian doctrine or thought that exists within so-called christian households i'm gonna let my children def decide for themselves what is the christian's absolute truth when it comes to uh, uh whether or not you should raise children in the what fear and admonition of the Lord, right? Do they get to choose for themselves? They may, but what it, your role is what? As parents, to train up a child in the way that it should go, ha having established that there is a way that the child should be taught and it should go now if it does not go that way well it should be <laughs> that child should go this way and you should teach them in this way and there is no room for allowing the child to collect information and decide on their own that's postmodern absolute raise up a child in the way that it should go and what when he goes up grows up he won't stray from it. That's absolute thought. That's not relativistic stuff. That's that's good old evangelical Christian stuff. Yeah, hard, fast, rigid, and unmoving. Beautifully and wonderfully freeing from sin. What is the truth of the gospel? What is the what is the truth of the word of God do for you? Mm -hmm declares right and wrong it protects me from deceivers it constrains me it convicts me and at the same time it sets me free biblical truth is what defines right and righteousness biblical truth again if i'm, I'm asking you think about it in your mind it's doctrine right it's it's what should be taught and believed the truth, the truth stands, and I like that personification because that picture of a strong structure standing, well fixed and firmed and founded, never to be moved, it stands to dispel or expose anything that is not truth, anything that's a lie. How would you say it? I'd be interested in just listening to Christians, both young and old, who've been around it for a while, maybe new to it, or young people in the current culture, because that's that's an amazing thing to grow up in these times as a Christian. 
when you are very likely going to be in any number of your collection of friend groups and cohorts, you may well be or very likely to be the only one there who's a believer. And if you are an evangelical or a, one of those, if you one of those born again Christians, then you might be by yourself, even though you're in a room full of hundreds. Turn to the book of Psalms. We'll take an Old Testament text. Oh, and this is a good one talking about the truth of God. The Christian, what do we believe about truth? How do we stand on it? How do we move amongst it? What does it do? Again, just keep it in your mind. What does the truth do for you? Man, it's it's wonderful to have that tool, isn't it? So that you can, you can still love. What about all those spewing and espousing things that may, maybe they're proclaiming to be true? Or even those folks that are completely, absolutely railing against the truth, openly even. One of the things the truth does for the Christian there, it allows us to love. It requires us. It gives us the instruction and the tool, that wonderful love that can be this amazing this amazing thing that we apply to the lie or to the liar or that we give to someone or that we offer that we that we continuously over time and then make it also begin to enjoy it it begins to clear things up for them it begins to break the, all those cycles that they may be living in and being tortured by the truth allows us to love the liar while dispelling the lie. Psalms, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you the address. Psalms 26, starting at verse 3. Go to the 26th chapter of Psalms. Go to verse 3. We will read 3 through 7. Psalms 26 and 3. For your loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have what? Walked in your truth. He sees these things as part and parcel, but to what God is giving him, to what God is for the believer. Loving kindness, and he's able to walk in the truth of God. He's able to exist on a daily basis in Bible study. In Bible study, we uh, read the verse where Christ talking to the disciples and he says, if anyone wants to come after, after me, he's going to have to do what? Pick up his cross, deny himself. How often? Daily. It's your walk. So you are in the process or in the constant process of denying yourself for those folks that refuse to wear the mask, right? And I understand if there's a medical issue related, that's fine. Or for the folks who just say, that's my right and I don't have to. But for the Christian, the Christian should say, wait a minute now, uh, if I am a carrier, well, I don't believe that. We don't have to believe it. The Christian has to sacrifice. The Christian has to sacrifice. It's part of your cross. For the person who may not believe, for the other Christian, for the older person, for the weaker person, for the person who is in a high risk group. Right. Because I may be so strong that I can pick up that virus and put it down three or four times and never have a symptom. Yeah. Well, if I don't believe that, do I have to? You don't have to believe it. You just got to sacrifice. Where is the sacrifice for the Christian? Wait a minute. I'm going to do it because I don't want anybody else to get sick. If any of those things may or may not be true. And there probably is certainly some truth to it. Why? Because have you been to the hospital rooms? Have you been to the folks that are in a lower risk group that have still died or the high risk group and have not been in a, a situation of high exposure? We're still in the midst, saints. They, they're they saying there are multiple, uh, uh, well, most cities, of course, since the vaccine, people have relaxed and the masks are coming down and off and the numbers are going right back up. And they're going back to levels where they were pre-vaccine. Now, I'm not saying, again, that we accept everything and don't scrutinize it, but there should be for the Christian. Our lives are different. 
that truth requires sacrifice. And if it's a lawful order, then we should abide. Scripture says we should live peaceably as best we can in this world, right? Amongst men. And if we have a lawful order, that law order is not in violation of Scripture. Not at all. I'm sorry. He says here, your loving kindness, the psalmist does, is before mine eyes. That means I am constantly aware of what you've provided, of how you've comforted, of your care and concern for me. That for me, very again, recently, is something that is ah, just, I'm 52 years, almost 52, and it's brand new all over again. It's like, wait a minute, he has, he, he comforts me and he cares for me and he'll actually, well, he'll do stuff for me. I'm supposed to be doing stuff for him. I owe him. He doesn't owe me. But he's still, I can ask him for things that he doesn't owe me. I can just say, Lord, I appeal to your kindness and to your love. And if it be your will, knowing that I am not worthy. Please, Lord, I trust, hope, and pray it is your will. And if it's not, your will be done. Your loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in your truth. Now, the psalmist isn't saying, wait a minute, Pastor, you just said your truth. So you're saying the psalmist believes in relative truth? No, the psalmist is saying, capital Y-O-U-R, truth, your truth is the truth, right? He's saying in a world in amidst a world swirling and full of other philosophy and other people claiming truths and false teachers. He's saying, I'm walking in the one truth. I am recognizing and acknowledging you and your truth as the absolute truth. He's also saying, if I can paraphrase, and I've walked in your truth, paraphrasing, and because I walk in your truth and abide in it constantly, I do not. Christians, remember this, of course, you'll know it if you've been a Christian for a day. Christians are defined by what they do, right? And also by what they don't do. Christians are defined by what they do and don't do as far as behavior, if you would. And I've walked in your truth. And he goes on to say, and I do not. I do walk in it, but because I walk in it, there's some stuff I can't do, won't do, won't ever do. I do not sit with deceitful men. So the truth has exposed those that are, that are deceitful and will not allow me to rest with them. So because of your truth, I do not sit with deceitful men. Uh, and because I have walked in your truth, mm -hmm. nor will I go with pretenders, false teachers and the like. Because of your truth and walking in it, I hate the assembly of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. Mm -hmm. I wash my hands in innocence. Washing of the hands. A frequent, uh, uh, a frequent idea amongst the Jews and other cultures in antiquity. The most famous washing of the hands in scripture, who did it? Pilate, right? When Pilate had Christ there uh, uh, at, the, at the dais raised above and he had them in shackles and chains and before the, uh, 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 the Jewish council and all the people and he says, y'all got a problem with this man? He says, I, I wash my hands. Pilate was freeing himself from any responsibility of Christ's death. But of course, he's saying, I wash my hands of it, but of course, scourged him, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to kill him, but I'm going to half kill him. I'll let you kill him. And if you kill him, though, that's on you. I'm washing my hands. Again, frequent amongst the Jews and other cultures, Pilate being one that we recognize, trying to free himself from any responsibility for Christ's death. But here, the psalmist is saying, I wash my hands in innocence. Washing 
his hands in pursuit of the purity of purity, freeing himself from wickedness. He's saying, I'm getting the dirt off my hands. I'm, I want clean hands. I want these hands to be pure and pristine and only in pursuit of that that is pure and pristine and truthful. Think about that, saints. Don't you want your hands or your busyness? We're talking about what does the truth do for you? Or that was the question that was asked or this gospel of this truth and the busyness or activeness of it. Don't your hands represent that? Mm. You want them to be clean. You want them to be only in pursuit of clean things. What, what good does it do if you wash your hands and then you got to go do something else dirty, right? And typically we may, but there may be occasions where we don't do that, right? Mm -hmm. If you're working in the yard and you go from one, you, 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 you're cleaning, you're picking weeds, right? Mm -hmm. You don't pick the weeds up, go inside, wash your hands, then go to the trash can. Right? No, you pick your weeds up, you grab the weeds, you throw them in. Now, when it's time for your hands to get clean, I don't want them to be dirty anymore because I'm not doing dirty stuff anymore. I'm only going to do clean things. I'm going to wash my hands and not go back and forth from dirt to clean and dirt. Now, I know it happens during a day's business, sure. But when you're busy in those activities, you're not going to... The, the psalmist is saying here, I'm washing my hands in pursuit of cleanliness and innocence and purity and all those things that are right and righteous. He's saying, continuing on in the, the, the reference text, and I will go about your altar, O Lord. There's no way, other way to approach God's throne lest you're pure in heart and deed, right? He's saying, Lord, I'm coming before you as I've washed my hands. As now I'm, I'm no longer in the weeds. I'm no longer got dirt on my hands or under my nails. I'm clean and I want to stay clean. That's why I'm seeking you. That I'm a pro that I may proclaim the voice of thanksgiving and declare all your wonders, all because I've walked in your truth. I'm walking in God's truth, then I can be in pursuit of those things because it clarifies it for me. I know these groups over here are deceitful and these are the wicked and I can't stop. And I don't want to pause and I'm not going to give them my time. Why? Because my hands are clean. And I got to go to a place where there's going to be some clean folks or some folks with clean hands and clean truth and clean thought and godly and biblical. And those are the things I want. Now I am going to be in the midst of. I want to be a shining light unto. I want God to equip me and actually foster relationships in many cases. So that I can be an assistance to the kingdom. But that's not who I am. We talked about or defined what this word of God is, at least in this case in verse 12. The word of God is the truth of God. It's that amazing tool that God has given us. It's, it's, it's a bright and shining light amongst darkness. So he's, we've defined what he means by the word of God, a gospel in this case. And we'll talk about a little bit now the design of this truth or desi the design of this gospel. He continues in verse 12, back to our reference, excuse me, back to our text. And he says, for the word of God is living. So this truth of God or this truth of the word of God, however you might like to say it. This truth that is the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit. Now the Hebrew writer is communicating again to these Jewish believers some of the particulars of this design of God's truth, how God has designed his gospel and what it's supposed to what it is and what it's done and what it does. Mm -hmm. What it is, and what it does. And the first word he uses is living. It's living, it's alive. Or your good old King James may say what? Quick. Right? Because he will be the judge of the what? Quick and the dead. So those that are living quick or those that are dead. 
synonymous, of course, with being alive. Quick meaning alive, and the word in the Greek is zao, Z-A-O. Living or quick. And it means amongst the living and not the dead. Okay, we can accept that. Amongst the living, living, not dead. Here the Hebrew writer uses a metaphor imagining its meaning or in the meaning that the truth is full of vigor, fresh, strong, words like efficient, powerful, efficacious. What does efficacious mean? We don't use that very often, right? It's effective, it's in, a, in its intent, right? What is it in attending to do and is it able to accomplish what it intends? You wanna be efficacious in your day, in your day's business. If you're in school or college, if you got homework, you wanna be efficacious. I woke, I wake up and I have some assignments and I gotta turn on uh, Zoom and everything else nowadays and most folks still online. And if you're efficacious, that means the stuff that you, 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 you got done was the stuff you intended to get done. Or the stuff that's on your to-do list, you're knocking them off. Efficacious, powerful, strong, efficient, fresh, full of vigor. That's what this truth is or what this word of God is. It gets the job done for the Christian. It's the thing that we need. It just puts everything in its place. Also uses the term active, powerful in the Greek, energese, E-N-E-R-G-E-C-E, -E -E, or energies, excuse me. Energies in the Greek, again meaning effectual. The word of God or this truth of God is alive or it's quick. It's active, powerful, energetic, effectual, strong. That's how he is describing the word of God. Now, in that, these two terms placed together are defined with terms like efficient, effectual, efficacious, then this truth has a purpose. This truth of God, these words, these, 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 these doctrines are designed. They have a design. And he's saying they are effective. They are successful in achieving their design, what they were designed for. Some of the texts that would help us understand this uh, 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 the good old Christian King James thought, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. He's saying the design of my work down here, Christ, was to draw men by the work that he had done, that perfect and sinless work. And if I'm lifted up, of course, lifted up on the cross, and of course, lift it up in our lives and lift it up in life, lift it up uh, 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 in, in, in the, 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 the effective, effectiveness of the truth in the life of the Christian. If that is lifted again, put on display, mm -hmm. then what is that going to do? It's going to draw. It's going to be effective. He's saying, you do that and I'll do this. You lift me up and they'll come. Look how it happens in your families. If you've done so and done so with great diligence, there should be some effects, right? You should see some folks. Bible study, one of uh, the Gaston's relatives, uh, uh, please forgive if you're listening in and I don't remember the name. I was a Lawson actually <laughs> on mom's side. And she said, I'm 50 something now and it didn't happen until I was 40 something. She said at 40 something, I was changed and I wasn't living a changed life or a life that looked changed. He was saying I lived a different way. And that effective gospel changed me at 40 something. That gospel, somebody had lifted up and it was this bright and shining light that she had ignored for how, whatever period of time. But then it took hold and accomplished its goal. It was effective. 
It's doing its work. Again, the gospel has a design. That design is that it is alive, it's not dead, and well, as we have said in the title, it's effective, it's active, it's busy. The gospel is employed and busy doing its work. The gospel has a job to do, and the gospel is getting its job done. That's the title again, Alive and Well. Because if I'm alive, and I, 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 I have a really close friend and learned that uh, he was on life support just in the last couple of days. My age, guy that I grew up with, literally. Um, just keep him in your prayers. Keep Brother Tate in your prayers, please. Um, it hurt that he was responsive the next day. Uh, the previous day, it was touch and go. I haven't heard a more recent update. He's alive, though. That means that we're going to pray that God keeps him alive. We're going to pray that he begins to thrive, that he is actually not just alive. or not barely alive, but alive and well, alive and thriving, alive and flourishing. And that's what we're talking about with respect to this gospel, the title being the word of God alive and well, because it ain't just alive. It's not barely alive. It's not you know, waiting to die is, is the point. It's not just still in existence, not just on life support, but it's alive and well. The gospel is thriving and accomplishing its tasks and doing so effectively. The gospel, the question is not, is the gospel effective? Because the answer it is, is it is. Because if it's not, then God's lying and he can't lie, right? So the question is not, is the gospel effective? The only question can be, am I an effective witness of this gospel? How effective am I? Because the gospel is going to do its work. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to, am I lifting him up? He's going to do his part. Am I doing mine? Question is, am I effective? Is the word of God or is this truth living and active, because it is, but is it living and active in me? Remember I asked you earlier, what does the truth do for you? Are you yielding to its wisdom and knowledge? Are you believing when it discerns, when it tells you that's a lie and that's the truth? Are you opening the door to other ideas and thoughts no, the psalmist way back in the Old Testament says, I don't, I don't sit with de deceitful men because of this truth. Can we apply that? Or do I go seeking deceit? You know what I, I one preacher uh, once said, and I remember as a much younger man, uh, and he said, everybody likes a little mess. Just the flesh in you. If you let it, then you will try to reserve for the flesh, those little morsels of decadence, if you're not careful. He said, and he just, just he was preaching, and he says, you know, wait a minute, because I know everybody likes a little mix. If you're still yielding to the flesh and not yielding to the truth, got to fight it, got to battle it. You got to just pray right then and there. Lord, there it is. That's usually what I go for. I'm turning and Lord make me stronger time and time again. Let it go. Put it aside. Actively fight it. Question is not whether or not the gospel is effective. Only question is whether or not it's living and is it alive and well. Alive and well again, the gospel is not just still in existence. It's not in the corner panting, taking its last breaths, or just out of the way, or just set aside and not in the mix. No, we've talked about for several weeks, Bible study and on Sunday morning, how again, when the Christian has the gospel, when the Christian knows the truth, he's going to and has to live 
amongst those that are deceitful and lying and false teachers. And he is there oft times, the young person. It could be one of my daughters or my son, my mom, certainly, my wife, myself, any, anybody identifying themselves as a Christian or having been confirmed as such by God, oh, they're going to be in the mix. They're going to be in the mix and they're going to be there to dispel. They're going to be there. I'm not saying they're in the schoolyard with a Bible and a podium preaching 24-7. No, I'm not saying that, though, may come occasion, who knows, in smaller uh, cohorts, you may have to find yourself grabbing somebody's hand, saying a prayer and saying, but you know his word says, you know what the truth is? Is it effective? Am I effective? Because it is effective. If you equip yourself, saints, he will give you opportunity. Is the word of God, that truth, living and active in me? If you are saved, saints, again, in this, this, this alive and well, this alive and effective, not just existing on life support and not really bothering anybody. Oh, the, <laughs> the truth of God is bothering some folks. Yeah. The truth of God, when it's busy, you're on somebody's nerves mm -hmm. because you're a Christian. Mm -hmm. You mess around, walk through the school halls or through your office or through, where, uh, through the grocery store singing Amazing Grace. Mm -hmm. Somebody going to complain. If you are a Christian and openly a Christian, somebody's going to say, um, can you ask them not to do that? Mm -hmm. Because it's going to be offensive to many. that alive and well, not just quiet and in the corner. You can't help being a Christian if you're a Christian. You're a true Christian. It just is, right? It's just who you are. It's just what you're seeking. You may find it and you know it because there are things that you do, you say, and you feel that you didn't do before you were a Christian. Or that you know still, even if you grew up in a Christian household, it's kind of like, I, I know that was God because I'm not doing that on my own. I'm not going to stop and pause and I don't have time to. And I mean, there's any number of things, there's any number of emotions that you feel or behaviors that you've been, uh, uh, that you've been involved with or things that you've done. And it's kind of like, Lord, thank you. Thank you. Because I know that wasn't me on my own. Equip me some more so I can be more assistance to somebody else. So I can shine a little bit brighter. Your light, not mine. Mm -hmm. The gospel is alive, but it's not just alive and on life support. It's just not alive and in the corner taking its last breath. It's alive, it's effective, it's well, and it's, it's, in, it's, 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 it's in the quad. When I say that, you picture... Uh, in the, something in the middle of a whole bunch of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. The quad at school or the quad at work, the city hall. It's in the midst. And it's not done. Another thing we mentioned in Bible study. If you are saved, then this truth has certainly began a work in you, right? Mm -hmm. If you were saved, that truth did, did, did the first part. Yes. Are you done? We asked the question in Bible study. And it would be great if that was the case. The day you got saved, that he literally made you all just about perfect, right? All I got to do is sit here and go to heaven. That would be like great, you know, no more sin. I'm never going to say a harsh word again. I'm never going to experience anything but uh, uh, holy and beautiful and perfect and lovely. Uh, you still got to live down here. He's began his work in you and he saved you amongst and in the midst of this world. But are we done? We're not done. And he's not done with us. Turn to Philippians 1, 6 really quickly. I'm just going to read it because you know this text. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will do what? 
perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. He's not saying that once I began it, it's done, it's completed, and I don't have to do anything until Christ comes. He's saying just the opposite. He's saying, oh my goodness, glory, hallelujah, angels in heaven singing and praising God because the gospel, that truth was able to save you. And from that day, we are going to go through this process until Christ comes of perfecting it. And it's going to be ongoing. It's going to be effective. He's going to have some targets in there. What do you got you need to clean out? Because the, the effectiveness of the truth begins to challenge those ideas that you just accepted before, that you believed before, that didn't bother you before. Well, talking a certain way, right? That's strong language. Think about that. And today, even on just regular media sources, you will be watching something that is not cable TV in the middle of the day, and they will use the strongest language, and that gospel in you says that's a lie. We ain't supposed to be talking like that. But it's there all the time. Maybe I can't change it on that media source, but I can change it in the hearts and minds of those that God has allowed me to touch. That the children that God put in my purview, they may not even be your own. There are always some family members who may not be in the most tight or structured family situation, and they give you access to hold them, to touch them, to bring them in close to your family unit. And in those, those times is when you will have to, you need to, you must challenge those things. Can you imagine there are generations of children now who have never been to anything related to anything holy? They ain't been to church. Amen. Generations. They've not ever been to a church or heard anything of the biblical version, the only version, the absolute version of the truth. And when God gives them to you, then that's what that's that's part of being. Well, wait a minute. You said if I be lifted up, you know what? Let me lift you up. Let me tell them who you are. Let me show them who you are. Let me show them an example of a biblical husband and wife. Let me show you, young people, an example of a God-fearing high school student. Somebody's on a basketball court. You know what? I can tell the truth or I don't have to curse and rant and rave. I can play the game and I don't have to look like those that have played the game. I was during, just, literally just doing some research for the text and was as uh, I, uh, I was looking and researching a, a, a couple of basketball and baseball, but, oh Lord have mercy! And truly, it was for for, for the sake of why uh, and, and I'm and just the stories that just came up. Well, no, this person has been involved with, and then here goes a dating history, and uh, you know some some adult and and. And it was this one over here and how this one and how many kids at the same time. And it was, and I'm like, Lord have mercy. Wait a minute. Somebody needs the truth. There has to be somebody on the team when his wife comes or when he goes to his wife or when in the midst of all of the sin, the debased attitude, the degraded moral is a shining light is the, the absolute version of biblical truth. And they're going to stand out and they're not going to go to the club or to the spot. They go, they, 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 they go out the back door and they hop in the car with a couple of car seats and the kids, you know, they may be very, very well to do in the pocketbook, but it's the gospel, the truth will dispel all of the lies in a world full of them. And, I'm confident of this very thing that he who began a good work and you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. The word <clears throat> for this truth has changed you at the point of salvation and will continue to change you. That truth will continue to be alive and on life support and active and effective because you got some stuff that it's going to have to clean. There's some stuff in, in the corners it's got to scrub up. Maybe a few of the big things that just left when you got saved. You know what? I don't like it. I don't need it. I don't want to do it. 
But then Satan ain't going to stop. He's going to keep putting those things in front of you. Or he knows your weak points. Or he's saying, great, yeah, you can get rid of that, fine. But let me continue to just lay a few things in front of you. The work has begun, but it's not done until he perfects it. And the implication is it ain't going to be done until who comes back? Christ Jesus. The author who began it and the finisher. That means the finisher, the, the one who's perfecting it. The example of. The icon of. There's an old song. Says God is not through with me. Yet that gospel, that word, that truth will continue to be effective in you until it gets finished. And it ain't going to be finished until he is. He comes back. Now, some folks like to say that after they say it. Well, you don't have to excuse me because they say something or do something they ain't supposed to. And they kind of blame God. God ain't finished with me yet. That's not what the song is supposed to be about. The song is about that process of sanctification of that word and that truth doing its work for time until Christ comes back. Mm -hmm. Because at that point, whew, the weary shall be at rest. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that a great goal to think about? Like, wait a minute, there is a point where I'm going to get to just relax and glorify him and shout praises and thanks. See, you may be thinking, well, you know, at church and I'm tired after a long week of work and I'm actually thinking about tomorrow, Monday in the midst of Sunday. You, you won't have that going on when you get to glory. It is going to be pure joy. Everything. Think about your happiest day. Think about when you just didn't have a care in the world and you just were thinking, wow, if I could just sustain this, if I could stay right here, if I could enjoy, if I could just experience this, it's going to be that to the nth degree, to the millionth degree. And again, it's just going to be so beautiful and wonderful. And I always say that's why he's got to give us a body that'll handle that. Because think about it, saints, you can't even handle a, a good laugh. Somebody ever, if you have just been so tickled and then what happens, your stomach begins to hurt. Your muscles are not made to be clenched. Your stomach is not made to, your your jaws are not made to smile and laugh constantly. They're made to go through a, 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 a volume of emotions and feelings and contractions, right? They're not made, God has to give us something that can sustain that kind of joy for eternity. Can you imagine shouting and praising to just keep on, don't stop, keep on, don't stop. Even if you had one of them good old holiness churches, right? There's a start and there's a finish. Y'all, we got to go home because it's going to kill us if we keep on. Hallelujah, good time. Yeah. This body can't sustain it. Think about laughing joyously. But something is just truly joyous. And then you just exhale because you're exhausted. Think about never being exhausted and worshiping and praising. Think about as happy as you can be, and that never ends. It never ceases. Mm -hmm. Write it down. Don't turn to it. Second Corinthians 7 and 1. Second Corinthians 7, chapter 1, verse. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all the defilement of the flesh, and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That cannot happen without the truth doing its work, without the gospel, without the word of God, active and effective, not just taking a few shallow breaths, but it is your lifeline. It is who you are. And it has targeted those things in your life and those things around you. And it makes you a tool for God to use. And what does a tool do? Mm -hmm. A tool is made for a specific purpose, right? And it's great when you've got the right tool, isn't it? Because if you got the wrong tool, then you're going to hack some stuff up. It, you, you may try to think you're getting the job done. And by the time you get done, it's going to be pieced together. But it's not as it should. When you have the right tool. When God, when the Holy Spirit, when this gospel, when the truth is doing its work, it's the right tool for the job. Mm -hmm. If you're a liar, the truth is going to say, stop telling that lie. Mm -hmm. 
You're a gossip. Why did you pick up the phone again? You're a busybody. Stay home, sit down, read that Bible. Whatever it is in your life, whatever needs to be addressed, the gospel, the word, the truth is the right tool for the job. And we need to begin to con or continue to or allow the gospel to or the truth to continue because it's not done. So Christ gets back perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Saints, the work of the Lord, the word of the Lord, the work of the word of the Lord. The truth of the work of the word of the Lord continues. And it continues in you. It's not done yet. We'll pick up next time. Father in heaven, we thank you for your gospel. We thank you for your word. We thank you because it blesses us every time. Allow us to sit quietly and yield to it. Not to be argumentative, Father. Not to be railing against, Father. Not to do so, even if we're attempting to be obedient out of reservation or just because you told us to or because we have to father place a love in our heart for the, your truth of the word so that we do so out of joy so that we do so out of compassion for our fellow man and out of a willingness to sacrifice all if necessary in your blessed holy and mighty name we pray thank you father and amen thank you saints for joining us again and i trust hope and pray you'll be with us on wednesday night 7 p.m uh, is prayer time. 8 p.m. is Bible study. If the Lord continues to put it on your heart, go to handsomebiblechurch.org. Click the gold, gold donate button. God bless you, saints. We will see you in service.